Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, we lost over a million head of cows last year. Concern over a shrinking cattle herd in the U.S. and where it's leading prices. Plus, another follow-up on that WOTUS lawsuit, we've got a copy of the suit itself. And Southern Gardening, Gary has the DIY on taking your landscape to heart. And in our feature, the rest of the story on a supply chain solution. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. As always, good to have you with us again here on Farm Week. One trip to the grocery store and you know beef prices are way up, but one thing could send them even higher. The cattle inventory is down, the lowest it's been in more than 60 years. Peter Tubbs has this livestock report. Continued drought in cattle grazing regions of the United States has seen farmers and ranchers cut their animal numbers reducing the size of the national cattle herd to levels not seen since 1962. Reduced forage quality has been a big reason why producers are sending heifers and breeding stock to slaughter in larger numbers when compared to periods of herd expansion. The recent period of record grain prices has exacerbated an already difficult financial situation for some operators. Expensive corn has heavily impacted the profit margin for farmers, ranchers, and feedlot operators. Well, we've clearly liquidated the herd. In fact, if you look again at the USDA numbers nationwide, we lost over a million head of cows last year, which is the biggest, in terms of absolute numbers, the biggest year over year decrease in the beef cow herd since like 1986. The herd liquidations have been quickly eaten by Americans who continue to buy beef despite high retail prices. But the slaughter volumes will eventually decline. Well, the reason we had peak uh, all-time record beef production in 2022 is because we were eating those that inventory. Uh, that's a temporary thing that you ca can do or have to do when you're in the middle of drought forced liquidation, but it's not sustainable, obviously. Sending heifers to slaughter rather than adding them to the breeding herd can cause a rapid contraction of the total herd size, but it also limits future growth. The nature of the breeding cycle results in a slow return of cattle numbers, even when grazing conditions improve. In the near term, cattle producers looking to increase their herd size will face increased challenges in an environment of already razor thin margins. So what it means is the guys in the middle, you mentioned the, the price of corn, uh, all of the margin operations above the cow-calf level are going to be really squeezed in this process because the, the, you know, the, the top side of the market will adjust at least somewhat, but it won't adjust fast as fast as the bottom side is coming up. And so uh, I think cattle feeding is going to be a dilemma uh, going forward here because we're going to have not as many feeder cattle. They're going to be really expensive. And then we've still got a high cost of, uh, of gain in terms of high feed prices. And so those margins are gonna be a challenge going forward. Still on cattle, you've heard of Superman, but have you heard of a super cow? Chinese scientists say they've successfully cloned three super cows that can produce an unusually high amount of milk. That's according to state media. It's been hailed as a breakthrough for China's dairy industry, hoping to reduce its dependence on imported breeds. We go from drought forest liquidation to pretty much the opposite of drought, a winter blast. That, in particular, likely to help the West recover, at least a little, from all that drier weather. David Miller has the story. A winter storm pounded an area from West Texas to Eastern West Virginia during the week. More than 450,000 Texans found themselves without power as the weather made for hazardous driving conditions, causing numerous car crashes across the state. The storm has been blamed for at least 10 deaths in the Lone Star State. Watches and warnings about wintry conditions were also issued for portions of Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Tennessee, and Mississippi. Several rounds of mixed precipitation, including freezing rain and sleet, slashed across the area, causing flight delays and school closures. Much of the nation's midsection was also affected by the winter weather, which led to events being canceled in Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. 
Out west, winter weather is being welcomed as the snowpack continues to increase. After multiple winter storms, the snow depth in the Sierra Nevada mountains remains at record levels. For our survey today, we recorded a snow depth of 85.5 inches and a snow water content of 33.5 inches. That results in 193% of average to date and 137% of the April 1 average here at this location. The deep snow is expected to help relieve some of the drought being experienced by Central Valley farmers when the snowpack melts in the spring. The EPA's final WOTUS rule under President Joe Biden may be anything but final if 18 plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit against the EPA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have anything to say about it. Here's more. As you most likely know, WOTUS, or Waters of the United States, has been a source of debate for years. The EPA made a final redefinition of the rule official just before the end of 2022, sneaking it in during the week between Christmas and New Year's. And it was published in the Federal Register about three weeks later. It's set to go into effect in March. Almost immediately, the American Farm Bureau Federation and many other large organizations expressed concern, and a lawsuit, as we've reported here on Farm Week, has been filed. Pulled directly from that suit, the plaintiffs say in part, quote, Instead of providing much-needed clarity to the regulated community, all the rule makes clear is that the agencies are determined to exert jurisdiction over a staggering range of dry land and water features, whether large or small, permanent, intermittent or ephemeral, flowing or stagnant, natural or man-made, interstate or intrastate. Under the rule, plaintiffs' members will constantly be at risk that any sometimes wet feature on their property will be deemed WOTUS by the agencies using vague and unpredictable standards, making normal business activities in that area subject to criminal and civil penalties. In a public statement right after the WOTUS redefinition went public, Farm Bureau wrote, quote, Clean water is important to all of us. Unfortunately, the new WOTUS rule once again gives the federal government sweeping authority over private lands. This isn't what clean water regulations were intended to do. Farmers and ranchers should not have to hire a team of lawyers and consultants to determine how we can farm our land. Valentine's Day just around the corner. In our Southern Gardening segment this week, Gary Bachman taking things to heart with a fun gardening activity, even in the middle of February. Here's Gary. Handmade Valentine's gifts are always appreciated, and here's a great idea for that special gardener, a DIY herb garden kit. An herb garden kit is a practical gift to give and your local garden center will have all the components for the kit. Let's get started. I've chosen this cute little crate to hold the herb kit components. I've selected a variety of herb seeds that are easy to grow indoors. Because herb seeds are small, many are pelletized for easier sowing. The seeds need growing mix and I love these peat pellets. Place a pellet into a peat pod, add water, and watch the pellet expand. Drop in two to three seeds and place the pot in a windowsill. As for herbs, dill is a popular choice with its frilly fine textured foliage. This is a forgiving herb that is a popular choice for fish dishes, and the flower heads are used for homegrown dill pickles. Sage is a coarse leaf perennial herb. The common variety has aromatic grayish green leaves. Basil is a fast growing annual herb that's a good choice. Sweet Italian is a great pick for Valentines that love pesto. Thyme has aromatic gray green leaves that are wonderful with poultry dishes and an essential part of herb bundles called bouquet garni. And rosemary, a Mississippi medallion winner, has needle-like foliage and a warm and tangy flavor. Add a red theme plant and of course some candy and it's ready for your gardening valentine. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman and I'll see you next time on Southern Garden. We'll take a short break but stick around. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, an extended version of the story we brought you a few weeks ago. 
The supply chain challenges of recent years actually sparked some creative responses, resulting in new ways for goods to get from one place to another. Shipping from the coast has always been popular, but the Great Lakes region has turned into a new favorite. We'll visit Cleveland and Duluth, where smart operators make for savvy shipping. First rate freight coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Commodities still headed up with a few exceptions. You know, Mike, it never fails. You think a commodity is going to rise and then boom, <laughs> it just goes right back boom. down again. <laughs> and we'll be talking about that and more. But first, the numbers. Like we said, still rising with a few exceptions. And then in our row report, we take a look at which crops are the big movers right now. And finally, we take a look at less cattle and what that means. So, like we said, markets closed last Friday, mostly still trending up. A few commodities down a bit, all of them row crops. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, soybean oil, down about one and a half cents. Why? Seems the same reasons from last week. Biodiesel needs prompting a correction. Last week's biggest gain, live cattle, up $3.30. This follows our story earlier in the show. Demand still high while supplies dwindling. We'll get into it more in a bit. So, in our row report this week, crops up and down, soybeans getting it best. However, in vegetable produce imports from Mexico, we've seen a surge these past few years, according to a new USDA report. Imports of Mexican avocados totaled nearly $3 billion from December 2021 to November 2022. That's a 13% increase. Imports of berries, excluding strawberries during that same time, totaled nearly $2.5 billion, up 15%. Imports of tomatoes from December 2021 to November 2022 totaled $2.43 billion. That's up 3%. Imports of fresh peppers totaled $1.44 billion. That's technically a 3% decrease from the last year, but still a 13% increase in the past two years. So back to row crops. Analyst Sean O'Leary says war, stocks, and weather, the big movers. The war being priced in, if you look at the prices now, um, I'm not sure if that's the case because look what the market did in the spring of last year when we had to price the conflict in. Uh, we, we essentially gave back all of the gain. So it, it's almost as if there's very little, if any, war premium there. Um, I, I've seen some, some news reports where the next six weeks are pretty, pretty pivotal. I think there's a little bit of fear about what what Russia might do, like, you know, essentially throwing the whole kitchen sink at them, unfortunately. 
and that that corridor has been uh, not talked about quite as much when they first set it up and there's been a pretty pretty good flow of product but it's uh, it, it's coming from a, a lesser amount of production from them as well corn in a lot of respects is kind of like the wheat markets just a little bit a little bit range bound uh, the the option premiums are pretty pretty small due to, to lack of volatility I think uh, we've got a stocks report next week, and then obviously the bigger uh, one further down the road is planning intentions in March. Uh, so if you've got to take some price protection, I think there's a number of different ways you can do that. If you're, if you're kind of undersold, there's some things that you can do with covered short option premium. I've always been an advocate of that, uh, uh, both for hedgers and speculators. It's not. A, a very big hedge, I'd call it kind of passive, but it's a hedge nonetheless, uh, and sometimes can be better than sitting on your hands doing nothing. The last USDA report uh, um, was bullish, uh, had some initial bullish reaction, but essentially gave it, uh, gave most of it back over the next couple of weeks. So uh, that, that story has been talked about for a long time. Uh, I think they can get some weather, beneficial weather, into the end of this month that could improve the bean crop. Probably not going to do much for their corn crop. Uh, so there is still a chance for some improvement. There's also a chance that if that precip later this month, uh, if they don't get it, there's going to be further cuts, I think. In the cattle markets, the big news is, well, we have less cattle. According to the recent USDA U.S. Cattle Report, cattle and calves in the U.S. down 3% from last year. Cows and heifers that have calved also down 3%. Cattle and calves on feed down 4%, and the 2022 calf crop down 2%. Once again, market analyst Sean O'Leary tells us what that means. Well, I think that report and the weather is, is a big part of it. But if you look at the way the cattle have traded for months and months now, I think you could probably take away that report. You could probably lessen the weather impact and probably still see new contract highs. That's just the way that market has traded. Uh, the, the consumer hasn't backed away. Um, but I, honestly, I think the more that market trades higher, the less friendly I would be. Uh, cattle have been known historically to have uh, some big washouts on, on some, some bearish news. You, you, you just don't know where it's going to come from. You can't see new contract highs and wonder where to get short without it, having to admit I'm trying to pick a top. You know, <laughs> you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'd say it still looks friendly. There, there's really no reason, in my opinion, technically, or from anything I see on the chart that says we're due for a $20 drop. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Early in the year and so much to talk about, it'll be an inter interesting one for sure. Mike. Thank you, Zach. So you've heard of making lemonade from lemons, right? The supply chain challenge that came with the pandemic prompted shippers and shipping companies to put on their thinking caps and look for cost-effective ways to move goods out of the Midwest. Turns out the Great Lakes region was the answer. Laura Weber Davis has the story. Since 2020, backups at ports in the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have left cargo ships stacked up, waiting to unload in the U.S. And rising lost. fuel costs, congested highways, and a shortage of truck drivers are also creating headaches for businesses wanting to get their goods in or out of the U.S. interior. And they're looking for other options. Will Friedman is president and CEO of the Port of Cleveland. The companies that need to move these goods, either as a manufacturer or as a retailer, um, they're pretty desperate. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And they're now asking much more so than previously, why can't we get a ship into Cleveland and just avoid all that gridlock at, at those big ports? But rerouting cargo from congested coastal ports to Cleveland isn't so simple. On the Great Lakes, freighters mainly move bulk cargoes like iron ore, grain, and coal that are loaded loose into the ship's holds. 
but globally, most cargo is moved in containers. Great Lakes freighters and the ports they visit aren't really set up to handle large shipments in containers, but that may be changing. In 2014, the Port of Cleveland saw an opportunity and developed the first container service on the Great Lakes to handle import and export cargo. In partnership with Dutch company Splithof, they created the Cleveland Europe Express with a regularly scheduled route between Cleveland and Antwerp. The Peyton Lynn Sea, a small container ship, travels out of the St. Lawrence Seaway and across the Atlantic. The trip takes approximately 14 days, with a few days in each port to unload. And the opportunity to move other types of cargo on the Great Lakes in containers is providing new cost-effective transportation solutions for some shippers. It actually does help with cost for a ship to come all the way into Cleveland because the longer you keep cargo on the water, the more economical it is. The majority of the cost to move, let's say, a flat screen TV from China to Chicago or Columbus, Ohio, is the inland transportation, the over the land transportation. Once it's on a ship, even if it's a smaller ship, doesn't have to be a mega ship, doesn't cost that much because you have those, you know, economies of scale. You, you're just pushing that ship through the water. You're not burning as much fuel. It's also more sustainable. It's also a greener form of transportation. And according to Friedman, shipping through Cleveland avoids the delays that can happen at congested ocean ports. Unlike the big ports where your container may be on a ship and it sits at anchor, you know, waiting to get to a berth for 30 days or 15 days, uh, our service is more reliable. In Cleveland, the cargo and containers has been mostly industrial, non-consumer goods, and exports from northern Ohio and bordering states. But on more than one occasion, they have been the answer for a business outside their region. We just had some rubber, synthetic rubber, um, moving up from Houston, uh, getting trucked all the way up here uh, to get loaded onto the Peyton and go to Europe. Um, so uh, those are the kinds of, uh, you know, somewhat uh, counterintuitive uh, moves we're seeing here with all these supply chain problems. They could not get a ship or find space on a ship out of Port of Houston, so they moved that rubber all the way up here. And Cleveland isn't the only Great Lakes port that's looking to expand its container shipping. The port of Duluth Superior is the largest port on the Great Lakes by tonnage, including the twin ports of Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin. And it's making waves in container shipping. Deb DeLuca is the executive director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. From here, you can reach major markets such as the Twin Cities, Fargo, Des Moines, also Milwaukee, and even down to Chicago. So um, it, it, from, a, from a logistics standpoint, that's very attractive. Last fall, the port of Duluth was granted approval by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to handle shipping containers by water. And just recently, it exported its first shipment, 200 containers of kidney beans from a company in the region. They were having difficulties um, arriving at a supply chain solution with all the snarls and backups in supply chains over the past couple of years. They were not able to get their goods to market. So um, they, working with a freight forwarder, a trucking company, they were looking for an alternative solution and that ended up being sending those containers by ship through our terminal. Great Lakes ports are also looking into new options like a feeder service where containers are offloaded in bigger ports and transported along the St. Lawrence Seaway in smaller vessels, similar to what is done in Europe. Along with all the opportunities, there are many challenges to container shipping on the Great Lakes, including the locks of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which restrict the size of the ship. If you're coming into the Great Lakes from outside the system, you're limited by the dimensions of the locks. There are 15 locks that get you from sea level up to where we are, which is roughly 650 feet above sea level. And those lock dimensions are roughly mm, 750 feet long and about 75 feet wide. Uh, and the controlling depth of the water in all the channels on the Great Lakes is about 27 feet, 27 or 28 feet. So ships can't exceed those dimensions. Another factor that has been challenging for container shipping is the shortened season. 
both the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Sioux Locks closed during the winter. Many who use the system or ports on the system are at, like me, advocate for let's keep the system open longer. Um, we think that's feasible from a technology point of view. We, we all know, unfortunately, with climate change that we're not getting as much ice cover anymore. Winters aren't as severe. Let's allow more year-round shipping or closer to year-round shipping. Both the ports of Cleveland and Duluth expect to move more shipping containers in the coming year. Never underestimate the power of ingenuity. Well, next week they're called solar gardens, the wave of the future. In Minnesota, they're generating enough energy to power hundreds of homes and localized community projects. There are more than 400 such solar gardens and a waiting list with customers who can lock in energy costs for 25 years. This model is also a low impact pathway to extra revenue for farmers. Solar gardens coming to the rest of America, that's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. And that's it.